you ever felt. Are you listening? Damn. Sorry. Uh. Hey, you two. you can see my shirt fully but this shirt says shh no one cares and you guys probably don't care about this but like i said i was going to start doing series reviews on shows that are multicultural and this next show is a show that actually ended up premiering monday january 14th and the reason why i'm covering it now even though when you see this is probably going to be like two days ago the second episode came out maybe three days ago monday the 21st is when that episode came out so you guys will be obviously already seeing at least the second episode and if you want me to do a recap of the next episode let me know now this show is not a reboot at all this show is actually based again off of a series written by justin cronin and it's on fox on mondays at 9 8 central check it out it stars Zach Morris from Saved by the Bell. Okay, so he's not Zach Morris in this, but come on, who didn't have a crush on Zach Morris from Saved by the Bell? I know I did. So Zach Morris, who we'll see here, who is in real life, Mark Paul Gossler, is basically the main character or one of the main characters of this show. Justin Cronin wrote a book series. It's a trilogy and it's about vampires basically, but they have of course a unique sort of mythology about their vampires. The first episode takes off at a running start. We see these two guys, they're on some trip. They're in the, obviously a Spanish speaking country and they have only like one translator and then these Hispanic. Well, they end up leading them to this cave where their friend is, for whatever reason, in a cave. <laughs> I don't know. I just wouldn't have been trotting into a cave with people who don't speak English with me and I don't understand them. They don't understand me and we're going to trot into a cave together. Yeah, I don't buy that. Anyway, these two guys, they go into this cave and the two guys, one of them, and I'm looking at notes, which is why I look down. These names for this show are really hard to pronounce. So some of these I'm not going to pronounce. I'm just going to put over here for your viewing pleasure. This show starts with Dr. Jonas Lear and he's played by Henry Ian or Ian Cusick and I'll put the picture here and then we have Dr. Tim Fanning and he is played by Jamie McShane and if you watch Sons of Anarchy like I watched Sons of Anarchy then you will recognize Dr. Tim Fanning who is aka Jamie McShane because he was on Sons of Anarchy and he played I think one of the Irishmen. So they trot into this cave and it's really weird. The one guy who doesn't speak any English runs over to the cage not even runs he like casually sort of walks over there goes over to the cage unlocks it and then just opens it and I'm like why did he do that and then he just leaves but then the Dr. Tim Fanning who's played by Jamie McShane walks over trying to investigate he's like dude why were you in a cage in here what's going on and so in vampire tradition or vampire fashion just um basically bites down on him and has some lunch so that's how the show opens <laughs> I love it when a pilot episode starts off right at the, the heart of things instead of like giving us some boring backstory we don't see any of that it literally gets exciting within the first like five or ten minutes and then we flash forward dr tim fanning and jonas lear are in the hospital because dr tim fanning was bitten he has you know a whole bandage on his neck and dr lear is like oh my gosh dr fanning i thought you died and dr fanning is like nope but i think we just found a recipe for success because I'm amazed balls now. And so he takes off the little gauze thing that's that's all bloody still. It's like cleaning his wound or, you know, it's keeping his wound from being like this open festering sore. So then, but he takes it off and there's nothing there. It's all healed. And so Dr. Lear is like, my goodness, Mark, what happened? You look amazing. I thought you were dead, but now you're up and you're free and you're great. And he's like, yeah. So that's where it leads off. So I don't know if they were in a hospital in America or where they were when Tim Fanning was taken to the hospital, but wherever they are, they're like the only two people. And so you see that Dr. Tim Fanning is all good. At least that's what they think. 
So then we fast forward and we are in a classroom or I guess it's like a whole bunch of doctors are together and they're talking about basically finding different cures for like every single disease in the world. You know, they're hoping to cure it with whatever Dr. Tim Fanning came back with. But I think in the cave, they had to kill the friend that bit Tim Fanning. But Tim Fanning was fine after he got out of the cave and was in the hospital and he was Superman. They don't realize that he's deteriorating. So again, we're fast forwarded now into this I guess I don't know if it's a classroom or what but it's all these doctors are together I think they're like doctor scientists or whatever trying to find like cures for all these different things and so they're talking about you know this is a really good thing and they're trying to get I guess funding probably for further experimentation so they go down and show like what they've done to people and I guess what they did was take took out of Dr. Fanning like his blood and infected other people and other people now they all look like these weird sort of like their faces are really pale and they have like really visible veins <laughs> and I didn't notice anybody with any fangs or anything and they're pale and their eyes are like bloodshot or whatever and they kind of sit like they're just comatose almost so all the people that they've experimented on which we discover when they're down there looking at all of these people we discover that they have also been experimenting on death row inmates they present these death row inmates with the ability to sign up for this scientific study so that they don't end up getting put to death and some of them are obviously like score I'm on that road so they decide yeah you know like I'm game like I'll do it if that means I don't have to get the lethal injection or whatever I'm on it so you see all of these people and they've all been injected this blood from Tim Fanning they discover that yes they're immune to like every disease and they have even been infecting these people with like HIV and all these different diseases and these people like don't even contract the disease so they're like hey this is some good research but what they discover is that they deteriorate pretty quickly. Their physical features change, everybody's physical fe features change, but they tried one death row inmate who was a younger woman and she didn't look sickly. She looked normal, but she was comatose basically, or not comatose, more like I guess the vegetative state is what they're all in because they just kind of sit there, eyes open. They're able to communicate with people through like a telepathic sort of connection or maybe they get into their dreams. They're kind of like the Freddy Krueger vampires. They get in dreams. And so what ends up happening is they all drink blood too. Like they need blood to survive. They're vampires. So they're end up there like how all these inmates caged basically and they're just like feeding on blood or whatever. So the girl that they have locked away turns out to be the first success and they think that she doesn't deteriorate because she is younger than the other subjects that they tried this on. So they decide, you know what would be better? If we try this on a kid, because a child would have way better results and it's possible that we could figure out how to stop other people from disintegrating if we do this on a child and they come out just fine, but they're like superhuman. So all these doctors are like, all right, it's unethical, but all right, we see your point. I didn't mention before, part of the doctors, there is Dr. Nicole Sykes played, I'll put a picture of her here, and she's played by Caroline Chikezi. I don't know if I said that right, so I'm gonna put it here so that you can see and sound it out yourself. She is obviously a woman of color, black woman, and then with her, Clark Richards. And her and Clark Richards have a little thing going. Apparently they, they bone every now and again because they just got it. And there's no explanation or any, just no delving in deep into their relationship. That's just what they do. Then they discover after talking to each other, you know, I don't know if Clark Richards is the doctor or not, but I think he's like part of the military or something. I don't know. He has some connection. And then Dr. Sykes feels it's not like an ethical responsibility not to try on kids, but unfortunately she sees the merit in their studies and the validity for their study. And so she's kind of like erring on the side of caution because she's looking at it like we might have to take one child and try this on them, but if it works, we save, you know, millions of people. And if it doesn't work, we only kill like this one kid, but millions of people will still be around and we can try to find some way to make this cure and it'll be great. So this cure either will destroy the world or make it better. And I will read to you what is online as far as like what the show is actually about. Like I told you, it was a trilogy. So it's like an action drama that focuses on something called Project Noah, a secret medical facility where scientists experiment with a dangerous virus Virus that could lead to the cure of all disease, but it also could potentially wipe out the human race. That's why, you know, they're thinking like, hey, we're going to cure all diseases if we get a kid or, you know, we live to find another day and find another way to cure all diseases if we just kill this one kid. So for some reason, they decide it needs to be a kid who nobody will miss. And they set their sights on this one kid 
And I'm like, she's the only kid. Because <laughs> in the beginning, her mother is a drug addict. And I believe they're even living in a hotel or something. And her mom ends up ODing and dying. And this little girl is super intelligent and adorable. This is some great acting. Like, there are some child actors that I'm like, dang, that's bomb. I don't know how they do it. I don't know how to say this little girl's name. It's like Sania, Sydney or whatever. But she plays Amy Belafonte in the show. And I will put her picture here. And it took me a while to find her picture. I had to go to IMDb. But anyway, well, she plays Amy Delafonte. Her mom dies, and I guess she doesn't have a dad or doesn't know who her dad is. So she ends up in the foster care system. And for some reason, the government lands on her as their test dummy. Which again, I'm like, aren't there tons of kids in the foster care system that you won't know where their parents are? <laughs> I just don't understand why she's so important. But for whatever reason, she's the key. So Clark Richards calls up his good buddy, Mark Paul Gossler. And he's like, yo, Mark Paul Gossler, who I guess he does freelance work for them. He's like, I need you and some other random dude to go and get little Amy Belafonte. They're basically kind of abducting her because they're not with like CPS. So I'm like, why are you guys doing this? But Amy Belafonte is quick, quick, quick. When Mark Paul Gossler gets to the foster home she's living in or I think it might be a shelter or whatever um, and of course the foster parents play very like carefree loose bad placement foster parents and they're like yay are we still gonna get paid for this even if you take this little squirt and they're like who knows deuces we want to take Amy but Amy is like not today Satan <laughs> and she jumps out the window as soon as she goes up to gather her stuff she gets all her little stuff puts it in a backpack throws it out the window and she's like deuces I'm out. Mark Paul Gossler sees her jump out the window when his partner doesn't see it. But then when he just sees it, he's like, get her. And so they run after her. They end up catching her and put her in the vehicle to drive her to these scientists in their lab. And then somewhere along the way, we discover Mark Paul Gossler is married to who I like to call Nina Dobrov's doppelganger. And I'll put her picture here with her name. And I don't know how to say her name. So actually I do, but I don't know how to say the whole thing. Her name is Emanuela or Emmanuel, but she plays Dr. Lila Kyle. Mark Paul Gossler's character's name is Brad. She plays Brad's ex-wife. It's weird because they are on the phone together and she basically tells him like, hey, I still love you and want to be with you, but because you're off on these weird missions and things, I decided to get married to somebody else. I'm giving you one more chance to stop this. And he's like, I don't want to stop it. Do your own things. And she's like, but I love you. Come back. And he's like, girl, I got things to do. So he ends up just, they end up hanging up and she's like, whatever, I'm moving on with my life and I'm getting married. So we already start to see where this is going. And basically, Mark Paul Gossler and his wife had a daughter who died and we don't know because this is just the pilot we don't know what she died of or what happened but she passed away so he's got all these paternal instincts inside of him that he has found no outlet for until he meets amy and out of nowhere he's ready to just risk it all for little amy even including like choking out his partner and leaving him in a bathroom so that they can get away he can get away with little amy and he tried and he fights for little amy hardcore because they discover that he is absconded with their package and instead of finding another kid with no parents they fixate on her and they're like we're gonna do something but he takes it upon himself to be like the head nacho in charge and decides like he's gonna save her and he feels like these paternal instincts for her so he becomes her surrogate father and they try to go to his ex-wife's house to find him but she plays it cool and acts like she's talking to a patient on the phone and not him and she basically gives him all the information that he needs to know so that he can escape with little amy belafonte and it's so sweet because he is cute with her but the problem is is that they did spend a lot of time building up i mean they didn't spend a ton of time but they spent some time building up amy and so you really kind of get a grasp for her as a child but you never feel like you understand why mark paul gossler is going to risk it all for little amy i mean she's not the only kid to be surrogate father for why her so she's a little black child too obviously if you saw the picture she black but um so it's really interesting it's a very multicultural cast you have all these different dynamics and i'm really interested to see where this show goes i really hope it doesn't get canceled I will have tuned in. By the time you see this, I will have already watched the second episode. I hope you did too. Come back so we can talk about it. Like I always say, um, and I'll put a spoiler warning in the beginning, which I think I did. <laughs> so if you didn't see this episode, I'm sorry. Read the books. And, I'm probably didn't, and I didn't explain it all the way, so you'll still have time. But um, definitely share this video. If you have anything you want me to check out and review here, great. I think this is a really good addition to this series because it's the Pied Rider 
series and it just goes over that and then my next video is going to be starting with some of the books so i will get into that a little bit later on and then i will be still doing the adventures and dating four part series from the defining moment so like subscribe comment and share this definitely smoke signal carrier pigeon morse code whatever you got to do share this with people post this places and let's keep this going keep the conversation going in the comments but know that i will block you if you get racist or weird so i think that's it <laughs> don't you hate it when i'm awkward at the end of the shows it's late bye you too have you ever felt are you listening